take it away. Yeah, I, I would like to thank Adam and the rest of my colleagues at the ASPNR for the invitation to speak today and for organizing this fabulous lecture series. Um, the title of my talk is Neurocutaneous Syndromes, also known as phacomatoses. Uh, my one disclosure is I am definitely not an expert in neurocutaneous syndromes. However, I am a clinical neuroradiologist, so I encounter these quite frequently uh, in clinical practice. So we'll start with an opening question. What is a neurocutaneous syndrome, otherwise known as a phacomatosis? And I, I know, I think neurocutaneous syndrome is now the preferred term, though I have trouble keeping up with preferred terminology. Uh, so if a neurocutaneous syndrome is a disorder characterized by multiple hamartomas and other congenital malformations affecting mainly structures of ectodermal origin. So this uh, definition means that we need to know one, what a hamartoma is and two, what is a structure of ectodermal origin? Well, structures of ectodermal origin include the brain, skin, nervous system, eyes, teeth, and hamartomas are normal mature cells in an abnormal number distribution. And patients with neurocutaneous syndromes we know have an increased genetic susceptibility to develop malignancies. Now, if we open our most recent Barkovich textbook, 2019, um, these are all the neurocutaneous syndromes that are described in that textbook. So I think that's a fabulous reference, um, particularly for some of the ones that we don't see as commonly in clinical practice. Um, and in fact, uh, over 60 neurocutaneous syndromes have been described in the literature. But for the purposes of this talk, we will focus on the five most common neurocutaneous syndromes that we see in clinical practice. Not only are these the most common that we see in clinical practice, these are the most common that we see on board examinations. Um, Having taken my PEDS and neuro CAQ not too long ago, I have seen four or five of these conditions on, on, on those exams. So they're important for us to know for that respect as well. So we'll start with case number one. This is a four-year-old male. So usually my lectures are um, uh, audience response syndrome, audience response uh, system based. But for the purposes of this, I will describe the findings. Uh, so we have flare images here uh, and we can see some ill-defined, oh yeah, no, we can see this here. Ill-defined flare hyperintense signal abnormalities in deep cerebellar white matter, brainstem and basal ganglia. And this is a coronal and sagittal T1 weighted image where we can see enlargement of the left prechiasmatic optic nerve and thickening of the corpus callosum. And then these are serial coronal T2 images of the brain, but the most uh, striking feature is outside the brain. We see this lobulated T2 hyperintense mass with some central targetoid appearance extending into the neural foramina of the right cervical spine. So name that neurocutaneous syndrome. This of course is a case of neurofibromatosis type one and we'll discuss a little bit why that is. So neurofibromatosis type one is an autosomal dominant condition, though majority of cases, not majority, about half of cases are arise from spontaneous mutation. Uh, they, uh, the genetic abnormality affects the 17th chromosome. And in clinical practice, the phenotypic expression is extremely variable. I had a fellow last year describe a patient in the waiting room who was quote unquote carpeted with neurofibromas. So it can be very disfiguring. However, I had a research patient last year who was a normal control who had imaging findings of neurofibromatosis type one and was, uh, was subsequently formally diagnosed with NF1. So it can be um, subtle as well. Cognitive impairment is seen as in 30 to 65% of patients. Now, neurofibromatosis type one is a considered a rasopathy. A rasopathy is a condition that is the result of an abnormal mutation of genes that include the RASMAP kinase pathway, and as a result, causing abnormal upregulation of this pathway. This pathway is very important in 
uh, cell proliferation, motility, and death. We can see the NF1 gene um, produces neurofibromin. And NF1 and Noonan syndrome are the most common rasopathies that we see. Uh, we have a rasopathy clinic here at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, which is a part of the Division of Human Genetics, where they follow these patients. Very interesting to note in the genetic pathway, um, we see MEK1 and MEK2 here. And you may recall that MEK inhibitors can be used in uh, patients with NF1-associated tumors and have shown some benefit in those with low-grade gliomas and plexiform neurofibromas. So the NIH uh, criteria for diagnosis um, uh, includes two or more of the following, six or more cafe LA spots, two or more cutaneous or one or more plexiform neurofibromas, freckling in the axillary or inguinal regions, optic pathway glioma, two or more leash, leash nodules or iris hamartomas, and then the osseous lesion, sphenoid wing dysplasia, thinning of long bone cortices, tibial pseudoarthroses, multiple non-ossifying fibromas, and then a first degree relative with NF1. From a neuroimaging standpoint, we focus on the cranial, intracranial and spinal manifestations um, to help aid in diagnosis. So from, look, from a neuroimaging standpoint, we look for optic pathway gliomas, other gliomas and tumor-like conditions, the characteristic T2 hyperintense signal abnormalities, UBOs or face C, which we will discuss. Uh, vascular dysplasia can also be seen in NF1, so we wanna check our globoids, calvarial and orbital abnormalities, and then of course, neurofibromas and plexiform neurofibromas. Optic pathway gliomas are seen in up to 20% of patients, though only about half are symptomatic. Most of these are believed to be pilocytic astrocytomas, though the histologic uh, data is limited. And these have a very variable course. Many are stable, though some resolve on their own, and others can be quite progressive and infiltrative. And almost, almost always occur by the age of six. It's very unlikely that we diagnose a new optic pathway glioma after that age. So as far as the characteristic imaging features, we can look for enlargement of the optic pathway. Here we can see enlargement and T2 hyperintense signal in the prechiasmatic optic nerves and enhancement on post-contrast imaging. Optic pathway gliomas, like I said, can be very infiltrative at times. Uh, here is an example of an optic pathway glioma that infiltrates the optic tracts and mesial temporal lobes and brainstem. They can also infiltrate the basal ganglia and septum pellucidum and can cause quite a bit of morbidity that way. Characteristic T2 flare hyperintense signal abnormalities are not actually a diagnostic criteria for NF1, though it's what we most see most commonly in the brain. And that was in fact how I had diagnosed that patient incidentally with NF1 last year. Um, it is important for us to be familiar with the normal distribution of these signal abnormalities so that we can raise a red flag when a signal abnormality is not in a normal location to follow it um, um, more closely for low-grade glial neoplasm. So the characteristic distribution is deep cerebellar white matter, brain stem, uh, deep gray structures, and uh, corpus callosum corona radiata. The pathology literature on what these represent is very limited, um, though it is believed by most to represent violent vacualization or kind of separation of those myelin sheets around those axons. Um, one thing I didn't mention here, so, uh, uh, these are often referred to as UBOs or unidentified bright objects, though the preferred terminology now is facey or focal area of signal intensity, which I find harder to remember, um, but something to consider when trying to maintain the same uh, language as our neuro-oncology colleagues. Uh, so in general, these appear in early childhood, peak at seven to 12 years of age and disappear by the end of the second decade. This is just an example from Barkovich's text demonstrating the evolution or the expected evolution of these uh, UBOs or FACES um, 
they start in the deep, they tend to begin in the deep cerebellar white matter, and then they tend to migrate to the supertentorial compartment. And then by the end of the second decade of life, they usually disappear. Uh, another character, so this is another patient with um, NF1 and optic pathway glioma. We can see the hypothalamus and optic chiasm are involved in this patient. And we can see thickening of the corpus callosum. And this is a reflection of increased white matter volume and is also characteristic of the disease. Um, tumors and tumor-like conditions. Astrocytomas are more common in NF1 patients than the general population. And most of these are believed to be pilocytic astrocytomas. These are usually found in the supercellar compartment. The brainstem is also common. We often comment on hamartomatous enlargement of the brainstem and middle cerebellar peduncles. Um, and I put hamartomatous in quotes because we really don't know the histology. And these patients are potentially at risk for obstructive hydrocephalus, but because this disease is so slow and indolent, the patients tend to develop alternate um, pathways of CSF flow um, resorption. So this is a patient with NF1. And if this patient didn't have NF1, I would be worried that, that they had a diffuse midline glioma or a DIPG, right? They have this expansile T2 flare hyperintense mass centered in the pons, um, infiltrating the cerebellar hemispheres. We had followed this patient for a couple of months and um, our colleagues got nervous and finally biopsied the brainstem and this was a low grade glioma. Sphenoid wing dysplasia is also described in the setting of NF1. And classic sphenoid wing dysplasia is described in the setting of a plexiform neurofibroma. Probably what we more commonly see in NF patients is um, osseous remodeling of the sphenoid wing in the setting of arachnoid cysts. But those don't have the same clinical implications of sphenoid wing dysplasia in the setting of plexiform neurofibroma. These patients can have pulsatile um, exophthalmos, and this can lead to herniation of the temporal lobe into the orbit, like in this case. And in this patient, we can see this abnormal expansion of the right middle cranial fossa, this plexiform neurofibroma in the scalp extending into the orbit. And then we have right-sided proptosis, intraorbital extension of this um, plexiform neurofibroma. This patient also does have an optic pathway glioma. For the spinal manifestations of neurofibromatosis type one, we typically see spinal neurofibromas, dural dysplasia, and meningocele,s scoliosis, and intramedullary tumors, which are believed to be low-grade gliomas or astrocytomas. Oh, here's an example of dural ectasia and lateral meningocele,s. Um, these are coronal images here, and we can see the lateral meningocele um, extending out through the neural foramen, and then the sagittal nicely demonstrates the dural dysplasia with osseous remodeling of the lumbosacral vertebral bodies. Um, plexiform and spinal neurofibromas are also seen in the setting of NF1. Uh, in our practice, we focus on the intraspinal extent of uh, neurofibromas um, for follow-up, though um, there are some centers that do um, examine overall to, uh, plexiform neurofibroma volume um, in the setting of response to treatment. Uh, this was a striking case I saw a few years ago. So uh, the first uh, image is a 13-year-old female, known diagnosis of NF1, and we do have a spinal neurofibroma with intraspinal extension touching the spinal cord. And she was lost to follow up, but then showed up in our ER at the heart of the pandemic with um, bilateral lower extremity numbness and left upper extremity numbness and tingling and weakness. And then this is what her follow up MRI looked. And we can see that this uh, mass has significantly increased in size. And now she has cord compression. Um, we, in neurooncology conference, we had talked about the possibility of this being malignant degeneration um, or malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor given the dramatic growth. However, this was resected and was, um, was um, pathology described as just a neurofibroma. And actually the patient made full neurologic recovery within two months. So it was pretty remarkable. And as far as why this grew in this patient, I guess the other thing that was interesting about this case, this patient was 16 years old when she presented here and 
did not know she was pregnant prior to this MRI. So we wonder if there was some hormonal influence on this patient, just interesting. Malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, um, FDG PET is going to be best at differentiating benign versus malignant, though there are a lot of MRI findings that are described, which are pretty nonspecific. Some of these include uh, loss of the target sign, increased T1 signal, ill-defined irregular mod margins, inhomogeneous enhancement and large size, um, diffusion um, ADC values have also been described as potential um, differentiators of uh, plexiform neurofibromas versus malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors. This is an example of a path proven MPNST. We can see this mass in the right suboccipital soft or the right posterior paraspinal musculature with absence of a normal central target sign. This patient you can see has other little plexiform neurofibromas and some right hemi-tongue atrophy there, but this had some FDG, this had marked FDG abidity and was worrisome for MPNST even prior to histologic sampling. So case number two is a 14-year-old female and we have our pre-contrast and post-contrast imaging demonstrate homogeneous enhancement in the bilateral internal auditory canals extending into the cerebellopontine angle cisterns in a ice cream cone configuration. And in the spine, we can see multiple enhancing dural-based intradural extramedullary masses, presumed meningiomas, and multiple small enhancing nodules along the conduct quina nerve roots presumed to reflect schwannomas. Name that neurocutaneous syndrome. If we have bilateral vestibular schwannomas that is characteristic of NF2. NF2 is also autodomal dominant. Uh, genetis locus is on the 22nd chromosome, which is nice. The two and the 22 make it easy to remember. And this is characterized by bilateral vestibular schwannomas. Uh, the mnemonic that we are taught is MISMI, that stands for Multiple Inherited Schwannomas, Meningiomas, and Ependymomas. So this is very helpful in describing these tumors on neuroimaging. The Manchester criteria for the diagnosis of NF2 remind us that while we're suspicious for the diagnosis of NF2 with bilateral vestibular schwannomas, if we have a unilateral vestibular schwannoma, we should look for these other findings to see if the patient is at risk for NF2. Uh, the clinical findings include seizures. And I think uh, and one thing to highlight is that hearing loss is relatively uncommon in children before the second decade. So this is not a commonly diagnosed condition in early childhood. Um, treatment, uh, we primarily employ surgical removal of the symptomatic cranial and spinal tumors, though anti-VEGF VEGF agents can be used for the vestibular schwannomas. Uh, so going back to the neuroimaging, this is a different patient who has bilateral vestibular schwannomas, and we can see dural-based thickening along the dorsal aspect of the clivus here. So there is a meningioma, or actually quite more extensively meningiomatosis. We can see um, thickening of the dura um, over the planum sphenoidale, and then we can see these ropes of enhancing tumor through the foramen ovale over the, uh, involving the falx cerebri and over the cerebral convexities. For NF2, the intramedullary tumors are presumed to reflect ependymomas. Uh, unlike children with intramedullary spinal cord tumors, without NF1, the most likely diagnosis would be astrocytoma, but in NF2, ependymoma is the presumed diagnosis. Um, and then I think we talked about the um, schwannomas and meningiomas, and then, then of course, they're at risk for syringohydromyelia. And this is just an example of ependymomas in NF2. We can see expansion of the cord and enhancement of these tumors. And then uh, these are just some uh, enhancing nodules along the cauda quina nerve roots in NF2 presumed to reflect schwannomas. NF2 can also have T2 hyperintense signal abnormalities in the brain and cerebellar dysplastic lesions like in this patient. And this can be seen in up to two thirds of patients. Case number three is a five-day-old female with 
a cardiac rhabdomyoma. So with that history alone, you might know, you might be able to surmise the diagnosis, but here's the imaging. So these are coronal and axial T1 weighted images um, demonstrating some uh, intrinsic T1 and hyperintense ill-defined signal abnormalities in the bilateral subcortical hemispheric white matter. On our axial and coronal T1 weighted images, we can also see some intrinsically T1 hyperintense subependymal nodules, the largest is seen in the frontal horn of the right lateral ventricle near the right foramen of Monroe. So name that neurocutaneous syndrome. The most likely diagnosis here, of course, is tuberous sclerosis complex. Tuberous sclerosis is also an autosomal dominant condition. Back when I was in medical school, we were taught that classic clinical triad of mental retardation, epilepsy, and adenoma sebaceum, um, otherwise known as, um, nit, I guess it was fits, zits, and nitwits, though that is not um, politically correct um, and not really scientifically correct either, since majority of um, since about half of patients have normal intelligence and not all patients have epilepsy with this condition. Uh, there is, of course, now more sophisticated criteria for diagnosis. Major and minor criteria um, can be looked up if needed um, and probably not necessary for us to memorize just to know that they exist as radiologists. Also note that they can have a genetic diagnosis as well of um, uh, TSC1 or TSC2 gene mutation. Speaking of gene mutations, uh, tuberous sclerosis is, uh, is, an ab is, is the result of an abnormality of the mTOR pathway, abnormal upregulation of this pathway, um, causing um, disorganized cellular overgrowth, abnormal differentiation, um, and the formation of tumors. Uh, knowledge of this pathway has uh, given way to the use of mTOR inhibitors like rapamycin, and these have revolutionized the treatment of tuberous sclerosis. Neuroimaging in general for these patients is recommended every one to three years and shorter intervals for those where we have um, subependymal giant cell astrocytomas. Some of the clinical uh, uh, signs of tuberous sclerosis we see, we briefly touched on adenoma, sebaceum, Ashley spots, cafe lice spots, scalp epidermal inclusion cysts with hyperostosis. One thing that I tend to overlook in patients is retinal hamartomas. Um, it's on my checklist now of things to look for in patients with tuberous sclerosis. That being said, retinal hamartomas are usually stable and rarely affect vision in these patients, but still something we can comment on. The other intracranial findings we see are, of course, the subependymal nodules and the subependymal giant cell astrocytomas. So the um, histologic literature on these is limited, and whether these are hamartomatous, astrocytic, or neuronal glial neuronal tumors is a little bit uncertain. And now, since we usually treat these with mTOR inhibitors, we have even less pathologic data to know exactly what these are. Um, the cerebral dysplastic lesions are uh, also referred to as tubers. We com commonly see in this disease as well. Under the microscope, these look like type 2B cor focal cortical dysplasias. And then we see other white matter lesions, parenchymal cysts, cellular lesions, and rarely vascular lesions. We'll always look at the phloboids. So another interesting case, um, this was presumed SEGA at four years of age in this patient. And I was on call one Saturday and the patient came into the ER. The patient was lost to follow up um, three years later, had a CT and we got them on the MRI scanner. And this is what their mass looked like. And I was extremely worried that given the amount of growth, that this was more than just a SEGA, that this was malignant degeneration, but my neurology colleague reassured me that while this was one of the largest SEGAs he'd ever seen, it was probably just a SEGA and all they needed was some mTOR inhibitors. So we never got histologic data on this patient, but they did get some shunts and they were started on um, uh, mTOR inhibitor and the mass has shrunk substantially since then. 
Um, but yeah, it's just uh, just a brief word on rapamycin and mTOR inhibitors. I remember when I first started this job, I was just blown away by how much these can shrink these to these uh, subependymal nodules. This is another case of response to rapamycin. So uh, there was a time when these were treated with resection and now we have rapamycin. And yeah, these are just some of the other imaging findings that we see with tuberous sclerosis, parenchymal cysts, cerebral dysplastic lesions. They can have enhancement, but the enhancement doesn't necessarily indicate any coexisting pathology. And they can also get cerebellar dysplastic lesions. And for the non-CNS manifestations of TS, I would say in the interest of time, you can refer to this um, radiographics article uh, by Wang and colleagues, 2021. But I will show a fetal case before we move on because I am a fetal imager. So several years ago, we had a patient referred at 36 weeks of age, actually for a possible scimitar syndrome. I'm not sure how that was linked to this patient because in the ultrasound, all we saw was this large cardiac mass, which, and nothing else in the lungs. So this was a presumed cardiac rhabdomyoma. And then on the brain, of course, we saw a subependymal nodule. So at the time we weren't tri trialing prenatal usage of um, mTOR inhibitors, but now our fetal consults for, um, for uh, tuberous sclerosis are treated with mTOR inhibitors prenatally. This is the same patient. We can see a few more subependymal nodules that we didn't see on the fetal MRI and very faintly some dysplastic lesions in the cerebral parenchyma. Case number four is a 17 year old female who had fevers and migraines, which is unrelated to the imaging findings, but that is what they presented to the ER with when I was on call. And on our CT image, we can see volume loss in the left frontal lobe with cortical calcifications. So name that neurocutaneous syndrome. Would it have helped you if I told you that they had a cutaneous uh, capillary malformation and a V1 distribution on the left? This was a case of Sturge Weber's disease. This has also been referred to as encephalotrigeminal angiomatosis, and it is a sporadic disorder, the result of a mutation of GNAQ. According to the ISPIC classification 2018, the most updated version, the vascular abnormalities associated with Serge Weber syndrome are congenital capillary malformations. So in the brain, that would be leptomeningeal capillary malformations on the skin, that would be cutaneous capillary malformations, also known as a port wine stain, though my neurology colleagues have discouraged me from using that term in reports. Um, they feel, feel it creates stigma for the patients. And then the eyes, they can get choroidal capillary malformations. So these patients can present with seizures, hemiparesis, hemianopsia, and developmental delay. Uh, for the intracranial findings, the um, leptomeningeal capillary malformation, also referred to as peel angioma, results in leptomeningeal thickening and enhancement. Um, and then over time, they can develop cortical calcifications in the area of the brain subjacent to the capillary malformation. And this is believed to be a result of chronic ischemia from impaired venous drainage. Contrast enhanced MRI is really important in these patients to describe the full extent of disease. Um, I'll just go back and say that unilateral enlargement of the choroid plexus can be one of the earliest findings of Sturge Weber disease, the intracranial manifestations. Additional to the parenchymal calcifications, we can see dilation of the medullary and subependymal veins and regional hypoperfusion on our ASL and atrophy over time. And I think we covered the findings here, but this is just a case of Sturge Weber syndrome with a PL capillary malformation or leptomeningeal capillary malformation over the right cerebral hemisphere, enlargement of the right choroid plexus associated right cerebral hemisphere volume loss. And then the dilated veins cortical calcifications. Um, this is a 
um, this was a newborn infant actually, um, who, who was born with a cutaneous capillary malformation of the right upper face. And on the MRI, the intracranial findings of Sturge Weber were quite subtle, but I, I definitely see abnormal thickening and enhancement of the right choroid with hyperperfusion on the ASL, and this is compatible with choroid, choroid, well, choroid capillary malformation. Sturge Weber disease can be bilateral. This is an example of a patient with bilateral leptomeningeal capillary malformations. These patients have a worse prognosis, not unexpected. This two-year-old presented to the ER with seizures, and we can see volume loss of the left cerebral hemisphere. And they went on to have a brain MRI, which showed leptomeningeal enhancement over the left frontal lobe and dilation of the subependymal and intramedullary veins. So very characteristic of Sturge-Weber disease. However, this patient had no cutaneous capillary malformation. However, five to 10% of patients with Sturge-Weber disease don't have capillary malformation according to the Roach classification. So something to consider. So that brings me to my last case. This is a 17 year old male with cerebellar lesions. And we have an axial T2, axial T1, and coronal T1 post-contrast image. We can see partially imaged cystic lesion in the left cerebellar hemisphere and multiple enhancing nodules scattered throughout the cerebellar hemispheres. So name that neurocutaneous syndrome. Well, the only one we have left is monopolin out disease, and that is the diagnosis in this case. This is also referred to as CNS angiomatosis. It is also autosomal dominant. Um, caused by a mutation on chromosome three. Mean age of diagnosis is 26 years, so we don't see this as frequently as NF1, for, for instance, but we do have a handful of cases that we follow here. Um, the diagnostic criteria for von Hippel-Lindau includes more than one hemangioblastoma of the CSS, CNS, including the retina, one hemangioblastoma with a visceral manifestation, and one manifestation of the disease in a known family history. Uh, hemangioblastomas are who grade one? Oh no, I'm sorry. This should be a, this is a Roman numeral. It should be an Arabic one for the 2021 classification. But these are who grade number one tumors. Um, they can get retinal hemangioblastomas and endolymphatic sac tumors for our neuroimaging findings. For a view of the imaging findings outside of the CNS, um, you can uh, look at this radio great radiographics review article by Ganesh and colleagues 2018. So cerebellar hemangioblastomas, they can be cystic with enhancing mural nodules, much like pilocytics, but in this case, this patient has multiple enhancing nodules throughout both cerebellar hemispheres. And these are presumed, to, well, this was histologically a hemangioblastoma and in this patient with VHL, the rest are also presumed to be hemangioblastomas. This is the same patient's spine and this patient also has spinal hemangioblastomas. You can see these cystic uh, tumors in the spine with some enhancing mural and um, extramedullary nodules. And then also of note is that there is, this is a T2 weighted image and this is T1 um, post-contrast and we can see um, an enhancing lesion in the right kidney. Um, so this raises the possibility of renal cell carcinoma in this patient, so something to consider in patients with VHL. This was just the example of spinal hemangioblastomas in Barkovich describing all these uh, dilated vascular structures, which I have not seen in clinical practice, but that is what has been described. Granted, my clinical practice of VHL is limited. I think we have three patients that we follow, but lots of imaging on those three patients. Um, uh, the, his, this is a patient at 12 years of age with a retinal hemangioblastoma. 22 years later, that eye is no longer functioning and there's a prosthesis in place. We can see how large these hemangioblastomas have become. So those are the most, the five most common 
neurocutaneous syndromes uh, that we encounter in clinical practice. And looks like we have some time for some quick bonus cases. So this is this this case was shown recently at our neuroradiology conference. So this is a two-day-old female who has these cutaneous melanotic lesions covering her entire body. So she went on to get neuroimaging. Um, and I think the teaching point here is that these melanin deposits, most easily seen here is T1 hyperintense signal on the left cerebellar hemisphere. There were some other areas as well questioned in the brain, um, but they are most easily detected in the unmyelinated brain, which is, so screening MRI is best performed in early infancy. And this of course is a case of neurocutaneous melanosis. This is a patient, this is a six-year-old female who has a history of multiple uh, extensive infantile hemangiomas of her face in a bearded distribution. And these are mostly involuted now though we can see some residual discoloration um, in, in, involving the, the face and the ears. On her neuroimaging, she has hyper enhancement of the right parotid gland. So we presume this is another uh, hemangioma. And then she has some vascular anomalies here. We have an anomalous course of the right internal carotid artery in the skull base, asymmetric decrease size of the right middle cerebral artery relative to the left, and asymmetric hypoperfusion of the right cerebral hemisphere relative to the left. And this was a case of face syndrome, which stands for posterior fossa malformation, facial hemangiomas, arterial anomalies, cardiac anomalies, and aortic coarctation and eye anomalies. This patient, now the, the story was, was interesting. Um, so this was a five-year-old with multiple flesh-colored nodules, which I could barely see, but if I blow it up, I can, I can see one very small flesh-colored nodule. And this was biopsied and turned out to be a basal cell carcinoma. But this was, um, and, and after this, this patient went on to get a genetic diagnosis. But this was pursued after we found this finding on the spine MRI, where we identified this well-circumscribed posterior mediastinal mass, where we had described this as most likely being a esophageal duplication cyst, but incompletely evaluated and recommended surgery consultation. And this was resected and ended up being a rhabdomyosarcoma. And the, the reason the patient had a spine MRI was because they were being followed by neurosurgery for shunted hydrocephalus. And this five-year-old we can see has a lot more dural calcifications than we would expect for a normal five-year-old. And once the genetic diagnosis was established in this patient, they underwent a face MRI to look for these. These are odontogenic keratocysts or keratocystic odontogenic tumors. I'm not sure what the most recent um, terminology is right now. Someone in the audience, I'm sure, can help me with that. But this was uh, diagnosed as basal cell mevis syndrome. <laughs> and then this is a 13-year-old with progressive left hemifacial atrophy. Um, but they had some neuroimaging from back when they were four years old, which shows some abnormal flare hyperintense signal in the left frontal um, um, white matter and some thinning of the overlying left frontal scalp. And on the susceptibility weighted images, we can see scattered foci, magnetic susceptibility in the left cerebral hemisphere compatible with hemosiderin deposition. And this is this patient carries a diagnosis of Perry-Romberg syndrome. And another case, this was a 14, yeah, no, so the, 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 this is from a five-month-old female who has these um, linear pattern of hyperpigmentation, which I found this interesting. Apparently, these linear lines correspond to the migration of embryonic cells during fetal development, um, but went on to have neuroimaging at 14 months of age, and we can see subjectively that the craniofacial ratio is decreased, and also, the patient did have microcephaly um, by head circumference. The corpus callosum is too thin for a 14-month-old. And we can see that there's evidence of cerebral injury. There's volume loss in the bilateral frontal lobes um, and like left greater than right peri and maybe bifrontal watershed or border zone distribution. 
with some associated magnetic susceptibility on susceptibility weighted images. This may reflect calcification or hemosiderin and deposition. And this patient carries a diagnosis of incontinentia pigmenti. And this is the last case. So this is a 15 year old female clearly with cerebellar atrophy. And this of course has a diet differential associated with it, but they also have numerous scattered foci at magnetic susceptibility throughout the cerebral hemisphere is compatible with hemosiderin deposition. And in this patient, this is thought to be the result of ruptured parenchymal telangiectasias. And this patient carries diagnosis of ataxia telangiectasia. I would like to, again, thank my colleagues for the invitation to speak today. Uh, and I would also like to uh, draw attention to our next Peanuts lecture, um, which will be given by Dr. Rispoli on craniosynostosis. So, that, so looking forward to that. And thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you so much, Osha. That was that was incredible. Yeah, it's uh, always always so much to go through with all of these uh, these syndromes, and it's uh, a lot to a lot to get through and a lot to, <laughs> to to remember for these. And I definitely forget to look at the for the um, the hematomas as well. Also, I feel like in the tuberous sclerosis, the um, orbital the um, retinal hematomas. Um, so, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the in the chats or in the question. Um, boxes and um i will um pass them along any questions any comments happy to uh make this a little bit interactive and i and maybe 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 for next year we can work on uh doing more interactive sessions and doing uh more audi audience response yeah no i i mean yeah I, when i <laughs> when i give lectures, i usually do the um, poll everywhere but um mm -hmm. uh, you know we actually had a meeting today uh, because the new residents will now be taking oral boards again. We need to move back to having them take cases. So mm -hmm. that'll that'll probably probably not right for this format. But yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that'll. Yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah. We'll we'll do some more uh, case taking virtually, like you know. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, go 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 back to that. I mean, I don't I I don't I, I don't envy everybody has to take the oral boards again. I would yeah you know. I, I hear, I hear, I hear everyone traumatized everybody, but you know, back in the day, but they said it was a good learning experience. So <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, I, I have already forgotten. No, I went to Louisville, so oh, okay. I'm older. So, but yeah. So, yeah. So, so we have a question. Um, so the question is, what is the nature of the um, cerebral, um, I guess, dysplastic lesions in tuberous sclerosis? Yeah. So it's, yeah. Thanks for that question. Cause, cause I remember when I first read, Barkovich's text about it. I, I I thought they were, I mean, I, I just thought they were hamartomas. Um, our neuropathologist tells me when she looks at a cerebral dysplastic lesion under a microscope, it looks exactly like a type 2B focal cortical dysplasia. So some would argue that rather than calling them tubers, we should call them dysplastic lesions of tuberous sclerosis. But I think that's you know, it's hard to keep up with the semantics of medicine. Yep, I know. As yeah, as we as we understand things, keep understanding things better. Things change, and then also people need to you know, and academics need to keep publishing. So we have to keep changing exactly, things too. Exactly. <laughs> have to keep telling people uh, other people are wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I get another another question. Thank you for the lecture. Um, how do you differentiate? Um, the fasci from an astrocytoma because they're both um, have edema and enlargement. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I guess I guess the the first part is sometimes we can't, and that's why we follow them. And and the enlargement of the brainstem, uh, like, uh, is something that is followed more closely. I think when we see signal abnormalities that are well circumscribed, that enhance, and that are not in the characteristic distribution of UBOs or FACI, then we raise concern for low-grade glial neoplasm. And concern, I guess, is, um, I mean, low-grade glial neoplasms tend to have a much more indolent course in the NF1 patients than the general population, but it's something we do need to draw attention to in our reports so our neuro-oncology colleagues can 
make appropriate recommendations for follow-up and in certain cases, treatment. Um, and the next question, um, uh, can the angiomas and um, Sturge-Weber, can they uh, not be present on initial scans of suspected Sturge-Weber or, they or they do, do they develop later? That is another very good question. So, so yeah, so I guess the short answer is in, in early infants, I, they can develop later, though they might have been present initially, we just don't see them. In early infancy, the intracranial manifestations of Sturge Weber can be very subtle and you may not even see them. Contrast enhancement, a, using a contrast enhanced imaging in ASL can be helpful in increasing our sensitivity for identifying the intracranial findings. Uh, Actually, that one case with the infant with the cutaneous um, capillary malformation, they had a non-contrast brain MRI performed at an outside institution that was interpreted as normal. And I mean, I think even in retrospect, I would have called it normal, but when we gave contrast and did the ASL, there were some very subtle findings that helped us kind of come down harder on the, on the diagnosis. Um, any um, recommendations for interval follow-up for suspected atrocytoma versus the facey facey. Uh, I I don't make a recommendation for follow up. I I rely on my neuro oncology colleagues and sometimes my genetic colleagues, depending on who's following the patient. Um, but anyone else is feel feel free to chime in. <laughs> and the nice thing about the NF patients is that they're usually plugged in already to specialists who know what to do. Um, then my other question, a question about about um, your protocols for follow up. So, are you giving contrast for all of these follow ups, especially like in tuberous sclerosis? Are you doing some without contrast? Um, it seems like, yeah, that they they try to do some without contrast. Sometimes the insurance doesn't cover the non contrast. Or, um, yeah, what's it? What's you know? What's what's your thoughts on contrast for follow up for some of these? Yeah, I, so I guess, so for TS, we we only recently have established a, a non-contrast TS follow-up imaging protocol, though um, I, I, we generally tend to do whatever is ordered by our clinicians. And I know, I know contrast enhanced studies for follow-up in NF1 is also debatable, the utility of contrast. I... I, I I don't feel strongly either way. I, I tend to protocol the studies as they come in unless I see a major problem, but uh, I don't know, maybe other people feel really strongly about whether we need to give or not give contrast on follow-up <laughs> studies. <laughs> yeah, I think, it's, I think it's always, you know, you know, even even though we don't have evidence that there's really issues with the deposition, it's you know these kids that are just keep getting all these, um, all these scans, you know, follow up. It's you know nice to at least mitigate it a little bit. No, 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 that's yeah, true. And then there's yeah. the there, there's the cost too. <laughs> but, no, yeah. that is mm -hmm. that is a good point. Yeah, yeah, but it's uh yeah, but I agree. You know, I don't you know, um, Susan Susan says uh, push for no contrast. Okay, there we <laughs> yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, another question, how did, how can you differentiate, differentiate between Sturge Weber and, um, leptomeningeal melanosis? Is that, I believe that's the question. Well, hopefully with Sturge Weber, you would have a history of a cutaneous capillary malformation on the face and hopefully for neurocutaneous melanosis, they would have cutaneous melas melanocytic deposits. So I guess the clinical history would probably be really helpful. Yeah, I agree. You know, I, I feel like a lot of the stuff they, they come with, with come with the indications because they're, they're, they're clinical, you know, cutaneous manifestations are so kind of typical. So. Yeah, know. no. And in the past year we've started populating the clinical images in the packs to kind of give us that clinical correlation. So makes our job even easier. <laughs> That's great.
and for and for the talk and for these talks you, exactly. you, you just, exactly. you just get the images right <laughs> but we have to be careful to maintain um patient oh, yeah. confidentiality so so that's the one thing i worry about a little bit yeah definitely I get, get to put the put the boxes on the eyes i guess yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> i still i still worry that i'm not doing enough but yeah. i, I mean mm -hmm. this is this is an educational forum so mm -hmm. yeah definitely um, I, I, another, another another protocol question for um the NF spines, like especially I guess NF one spines. Oh, do you guys no. do you have do you have you know faster protocols? Do you guys do just kind of um like just kind of have shorter protocols, or you do a with and without, or just a with, or um. Yeah, that, so <laughs> I, we don't really have a shorter protocol. We do have a non contrast NF spine and a mm -hmm. contrast enhanced NF spine. The Non-contrast NF spine does include stirs. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I guess the contrast is more is, is more helpful if you're worried about intraspinal extent of tumor. Um, but I guess you won't know if you have intraspinal extent of tumor until you start imaging a lot of times. So I'm not sure what the right answer is in that case. Yeah. But we do have two. We do have two protocols, different protocols that we use in different scenarios. Mm -hmm. Any other? Any other questions? And actually, yeah, okay. that and, and that. Uh, yeah, no, just 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 yeah. thinking back, that patient who was pregnant who had the mm -hmm. intraspinal uh, neurofibroma. There was a uh, questions about whether we should give contrast on follow up because of the potential, you know. Mm -hmm gadolinium to cross the placenta and we decided to give contrast um, because the neurosurgeons felt like that was the best way for them to see the tumor extent and to post surgery to make sure that they got an adequate resection. So yeah. case by case basis, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely another avenue for for research, for discussion, for um, improved uh, imaging, and yeah, as we get to, to to faster imaging, you know, with the AI and stuff like that, maybe you know we can develop you know more these more specific protocols. So there's these kids aren't sitting in the scanner for these these you know brain, brains and spines, which can take a long yeah, time. Yeah, I agree. Especially with and without. Um, any other? Well, yeah. I will say for all our, I mean, I think most places do this. The spines, we usually just do post contrast anyways. Yeah. Right yeah. Now. Agreed. Any other questions before we, before we break? Well, th thank you so much, uh, Usha, for this wonderful yeah, talk. Thanks, and, uh, thanks thank Adam. You. Thanks, everybody. Thanks really appreciate it. it. Yeah, and have a great rest of the, the day and month, and uh, hopefully uh, see everybody next time.